All right, welcome back to another week of aerodynamics. So up to now we have uh, studied all of this, including two-dimensional potential flow, right? Everything we are covering about two-dimensional potential flow has been covered. And uh, this is really the simplest uh, setting of aerodynamics. So potential flow, right? Incompressible, right? That uh, both of them gives you uh, the principle of linear superposition. So if we add two solutions, if we add two velocity fields, we get another velocity field. And on top of that is two dimensions. So you don't have to really think about, you don't need any three-dimensional um, analysis or three-dimensional thinking to think about the flow field. So today we are going to go a little bit further. So we are still in the realm of incompressible and potential flow. So still, two solutions added together, right, would get another solution. We still have Bernoulli holding across the different streamlines, not just along the streamline. But we are going to three dimensions finally, right? Okay, so uh, remember, we just uh, talked about uh, aerodynamic stability, and uh, hopefully you're all working on the homework uh, regarding to aerodynamic stability. And you're going to notice that uh, the way I'm teaching aerodynamic stability, I don't think you really find it in any textbook in the sense that uh, we are teaching in a very first principle way. Okay, So if you look at the textbooks on aerodynamic stability, they more or less reach the conclusion that if the center of gravity is ahead of the aerodynamic center, which is really a area-weighted average of the quarter chords, you are stable. If you are downstream of it, it's unstable. Okay, so this, this is a very simple conclusion. You can basically derive this <coughs> instead of uh, by plugging the numbers in your homework, you plug in algebraic variables into basically the homework. You are going to reach the same conclusion. But I'm teaching it in the very first principle way of how the center of lift moves as the airplane pitches up and down, right? Because this is actually more relevant when you are thinking about something not strictly an airplane. So just to give you an example of what's recently been happening, right? So have you, uh, if you are following the new developments in aerodynamics, you are going to see uh, a company called the WISC. A, a few years ago, it's called the Z-Aero, and it's renamed into Kitty Hawk, and the Kitty Hawk shut down, and but it's spawned out the company WISC. It's still uh, strong and alive, uh, developing these uh, uh, urban mobility airplanes. And if you compare the earliest the concepts of uh, this design with the current design that's actually flying, one of the major differences is that in a, as opposed to the propellers, I mean, a lot of them are the same, right? So, so there are eight propellers, I mean, in this case, it became 12, that is providing lift. And there is two propellers, and later on became one propeller that's providing thrust. Uh, but the major difference is that in, instead of uh, lying on the row that aligns <coughs> in a streamwise direction, the new propellers are now aligning in the stairwise direction. And one of the major problems that encourage the transition from this design to the current design is the aerodynamic stability during transition. That is, uh, when the airplane is still flying forward, but majority of the lift is provided by these lifting propellers. Okay? And this kind of stability is impossible to analyze using, using the traditional textbook of, okay, does your uh, does your center of gravity lie ahead of the mean aerodynamic center or not, right? Because the lift is not really provided by the wings, but by these propellers. And uh, as you can see later, the propellers interact with each other very strongly. So the I mean, when the airplane is flying forward, the front propellers, they generate lift. 
And as we have seen, when something is generating lift, how does it interact with the air? How does the air respond to the lift? The air is pushed down, exactly. So the air is pushed down. And as a result, this propeller sees a decrease in angle of attack, right? And in the case of propellers, the decrease in angle of attack is very, very significant before the airplane is flying at sufficiently fast speed. And then you can see the uh, propeller even more downstream sees a even further decrease in the angle of attack. And the propeller even more backwards sees like the most uh, negative angle of attack. So the resulting stability problem, it gets very complicated. And it turns out that it's very hard to control this airplane. And then the transition to this design, only having two rows of propellers as opposed to four, helps tremendously. So the stability analysis is like what you're doing in the homework as opposed to following the textbook prescription is really a much more general way of analyzing stability of not just the airplanes, but any kind of aircraft. And this is a, another example closer to us. So this is a startup by MIT students, uh, Electro Aero. Uh, how many people heard of that? OK, so I, I think they are hosting all kinds of sessions uh, uh, when they are recruiting for people. So. It's interesting that uh, what they are doing is instead of uh, using propellers to provide lift, they actually have propellers blowing against the wing, right? And you can see the flaps can deflect at very high angle. As a result of that, there is again very, very strong interaction between the main wing, which has crazy lift coefficients, right? When we look at lift coefficients in our uh, X-foil calculations, they are zero point something, right? The most is one point something. They can get lift coefficients of like five. As a result of that, if you visualize a flow calculation over here, the flow at low speed, like at takeoff speed, what they're doing is they want to take off like at distance of less than 100 feet, okay? So, so at basically, it's able to provide enough lift when the airplane is traveling at very slow speed. So when you visualize the flow field at that speed, you can see the flow over here behind the flaps, like or over here. It's not going like downstream. It's going down at like 45 degree angle. And, and as you can imagine, if they place the horizontal stabilizer instead of up there, but uh, directly uh, on the <laughs> over here, there is going to be a tremendous difference in the angle of attack seen by the horizontal tail versus the main wing, right? So the stuff you're doing in homework, the assumption that the two wings sees the same angle of attack is completely broken, okay? And although they put the horizontal stabilizer way up there to avoid the downwash, you know, like, incompressible flow does not allow the flow to travel downward over here without any impact on the flow over there, right? So we are going to see a little bit later in the three-dimensional uh, movement of vortices. Even though the majority of the vortices moves downward, it still has a high impact on the horizontal stabilizer. And uh, the stability analysis on this airplane is significantly more complicated than just analyzing, okay, is the center of gravity ahead of the mean aerodynamic center or not? you have to actually perform a series of computational fluid dynamics calculations and use exactly the kind of principles you've learned to analyze does the center of lift go backwards or forward, right? To see is this airplane stable at all flight conditions or not. So this uh, is really the motivation of why we are going through a lot more first principle analysis in the stability analysis than the traditional textbook prescription answer. Okay, and uh, today we are going to learn a little bit more how airplanes like this have different lifting devices. In this case, a wing and a horizontal tail, and in this case, uh, we have multiple rows of propellers. How do they interact? So now that gets into the 
three-dimensional aerodynamics. So today is the first time we'll think about in three dimensions. Okay, uh, another benefit of thinking three dimensions is how does the three-dimensional uh, movement of vortices impact drag? So we have all learned about the induced drag, right? We know the induced drag is coming from the energy spent in pushing the air downward, okay? But then, that's a qualitative answer. We don't get to understand how, for example, different designs impact the magnitude of the induced drag. So imagine all of these airplanes have exactly the same span, right? But this one has a, uh, a smaller chord towards the end, a uh, wingtip, and the larger chord uh, at the root. This airplane grows these huge winglets, all right? And uh, this is like the traditional design that has uh, uh, just a, a rectangular wing. And uh, this has a linear taper. And uh, how about adding a horizontal tail, which we know is probably necessary for stability. How do these different designs of the exactly the same span affect how much induced drag you have? That's not something we can deduce from our earlier analysis of just the air getting pushed down with an area proportional to the square of the wingspan, right? So we need more quantitative analysis to figure out how much drag there is. So this is uh, our motivations for why we now start to study three-dimensional incompressible potential flows. The first thing we have to understand is how do vortices move in 3D. Previously in 2D, we have deduced uh, the equation, right? We have basically written down the, con uh, the conservation of momentum equation. And uh, using the conservation of momentum equation, we took x and y derivatives on both the x and y conservation of momentum equations. And then we subtracted them to derive the equation for vorticity, right? So in 2D, the vorticity as defined as partial v, partial x, minus partial u, partial y, obeys the equation that the material derivative of the vorticity is equal to zero, assuming we have potential flow, right? Assuming we have uh, in viscous flow, actually, when we ignore the viscous contribution. In 3D, we can do exactly the same analysis, except for the math is a lot longer, because we have three conservation of momentum equations, and we have to take three derivatives, right? So that gets us actually uh, nine equations, and we combine these nine equations in pairs. So we combine the x derivative of the y velocity with the y derivative of the x velocity, for example, to get the equation for the vorticity in the z direction, right? And uh, etc. So, so basically, uh, I'm going to save you from seeing all the math because that will take too long. And in 3D, we get a very similar set of equations, but there is an extra term. So the material derivative of vorticity is going to be not equal to zero, even if we ignore all the viscous terms. It is equal to the vorticity itself times the gradient of the velocity vector. All right. Now we can appreciate, the, first of all, how this equation degenerates to this equation in 2D. Oh, remember, in 2D, what is the only component of vorticity? So first of all, let me let me just uh, uh, first of all write down what is vorticity in 3D, right? Vorticity in 3D is we get uh, so let's see x y z we get the original definition of vorticity in 2D is actually the z component of the vorticity. All right. And the y component of vorticity is partial u, 
partial z minus partial w partial uh, partial x and the x component of vorticity is partial w partial y minus partial v over partial z so uh, the as you can see that when you have a strictly two-dimensional flow field, what does that mean? A two-dimensional, you know, like when we are doing airfoil analysis, right? What are we looking at if you imagine the airfoil analysis in 3D? Well, we are looking at a wing that is exactly the same no matter which Z coordinate you choose, right? So that's an infinitely long wing that has no taper, no twist, no anything, right? No sweep or no anything. So, so basically anything along with it. That means the velocity u and v does not change in the z direction, right? So what that means is, oh, and also there is no z directional velocity, no w. So because there is no w, this is zero. Because v doesn't change in z direction, this is zero. Again, the second component y component is also zero. The only component which we define as vorticity is actually the z component. So in 2D, the W only has a z component, while the gradient of velocity right, in the z direction is actually equal to zero. OK, so uh, let, me, let me write it down more carefully. So, so this dot product actually means the omega, the vorticity in the x direction times the x derivative of velocity plus the omega in the y direction times y directional derivative of velocity plus z component of vorticity times the z derivative of vorticity, uh, of velocity. And well, all of them are zero because w, uh, omega x, omega y are zero and the derivative in the z direction of velocity is zero, right? So that's why this equation degenerates to the zero derivative equation in 2D, right? Okay with that? Now we have seen that uh, the consistency between 2D and 3D vorticity equations. Let's start to ponder what that additional term means. Hello? Oh, um, yeah, not, not, uh, I'm actually not recording the video okay. on my computer, so yeah, okay. thanks. Yeah, so, so what does that mean? What does this additional term mean? So what does that additional term do to the vorticity? So let's just, uh, first of all, take a look at some pictures of how the vorticity is kind of a, a moving in 3D. <coughs> Here, what we are visualizing is actually two things. One is uh, uh, basically streamlines, right, uh, over a rectangular width. This is done in a water tunnel, and there are basically uh, speeds of particles upstream. And uh, that allows you to see these bright strands of streamlines. And two is this really uh, vortices coming out of the wing tip, right? And what we <coughs> see is a remarkable similarity of coherence between the movement of these material <coughs> lines, these streamlines, and the movement of this vortex. So this actually prompts us to look at something that's very analogous to this equation. And it turns out that we can derive exactly the same equation. Exactly the same equation. Not for vorticity, but for the direction Right, let's say we take a material line. We look at the 
displacement, the difference in position between what particle and then adjacent particle. That difference as these two particles moves in the flow field partially satisfies exactly the same equation. Let's see why that is the case. Okay, so let me say I have two particles, x1 and x2. Both are functions of time. They are particles moving with the flow field. Okay, so what is the derivative of x1 with respect to time? If that location, I mean, if that particle moves with the flow field. just a weightless particle in the flow. What is the derivative of x1 with respect to time? Exactly, that's just the velocity, right? It's just the, the velocity at where? <coughs> at the location of the particle, right? At x1 t, right? Agreed? Good. So dx2 dt would be also the velocity, but now at x2 as a function of t. Agreed? Okay. So now let's imagine, let's just define delta x being x2 minus x1, right? That's also a function of time. And uh, uh, the difference between these two locations are small enough that we can use calculus. We can approximate the difference in the uh, in the velocity at these two points with derivatives of velocity. Now, what is d delta x over dt? Well, that is equal to just to subtract these two derivatives, right? We get v of x two as a function of t minus v at x one as a function of t, and we use calculus to approximate the difference. I mean, imagining that uh, x1 minus x2 is small enough and the velocity is a continuous field. So that is equal to, uh, just to use, uh, use the chain rule, right? That is going to be basically the x derivative of velocity times the delta, delta x in the, f the first component of delta x, right? The x component of delta x. Let me just uh, write, as, uh, write this delta x as a vector. And uh, let me just uh, uh, say, say the delta x as a vector. Let me just uh, write it as delta x, delta y, delta z. All right? So then uh, we would get dv dx times delta x times dv dx, uh, dv dy times delta y plus dv dz times delta z. Agreed? So that's basically using chain rule on this because the velocity is a function of x, right, which has three components, x, y, z. All right. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. And now when you look at this equation, dx dt is equal to the sum of this, which is actually, if you look at the, the, the similarity between the vortex equation and uh, the equation that describes the movement of delta x, that's actually delta x as a vector dot with the gradient of velocity. Exactly the same equation as this one. This is a very fortunate coincidence. <coughs> that allows us to visualize the movement or the evolution of vorticity as if that this vortex is actually a material line. Okay, let me give you a few examples. Imagine I have a, 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 a vortex, right? For, uh, that's, a, that's imagine a vortex that's a line. And imagine the vortex gets stretched. So what does that mean? That means, imagine I have a, 
see where in the flow field might be uh, easier. So, so let's imagine I have some vorticity over here, okay? And imagine this is an accelerating streamline, because we know this is closer to the core of the vortex and the uh, uh, pressure gets slower, right? <coughs> so imagine uh, the velocity at that location is actually faster than the velocity over here. <coughs> How would the vorticity change? Well, if we place two flow particles over here, all right, these two flow particles, because of the accelerating streamline, the two particles would be spaced further away from each other, right? That's basically uh, conservation of mass. Uh, so, so if you have accelerating flow, uh, the stream tubes would shrink, right? And the same cylinder of fluid would shrink in diameter, and therefore, because mass is conserved, uh, as a cylinder shrinks in diameter, it has to lengthen, right? Okay, so if you have two flow particles on the two, uh, on the two faces of the cylinder, that two flow particle would be spaced further apart as the flow accelerates. What does that mean? That means the vorticity. That means that if I have two uh, fluid particles, the difference between them, like delta x, would increase. And because vorticity follow the same equation, the vorticity would also increase. Right. So that's called the phenomenon called the vortex stretching. So if you stretch a vortex, it becomes stronger. And how much stronger? If I stretch it by a factor of two in length, it'll become twice as strong. Just like if I stretch a, a distance between two particles to be twice apart, the difference in x would be twice as big. It follow the same equation. Another effect, is when the flow rotates. Okay, so if I if I have two particles over here and the flow rotate, well, the difference between these two flow particles would stay the same in magnitude, but change in orientation. <coughs> right, the vector would stay the same magnitude but changing direction. So would vorticity. If I have the vortex pointing in one direction and the flow rotates, the vortex would be rotated with the flow field. That is what's happening here, right? So as the flow goes, turns a little bit, the vortex also turns. So this is uh, uh, essentially how we understand the, the three-dimensional evolution of vortices. That's just the imagine the vortex line as a line of fluid particles, All right? So however the set of fluid particles would change in shape, the vortex would just move with it. The direction of the vorticity simply oriented along with that line. And the magnitude changes in proportion to the uh, distance between the fluid particles like in, in, in that line. OK, questions regarding to that? No, it's a, it's a very hot a knowledge to make the first time you hear about it so you kind of have to see some examples but any any questions on what we just discussed okay so to build you a little bit of uh, intuition let, let's actually uh, watch a, a very interesting video so that's uh, what's called the vortex ring state of a helicopter so this is one of the more complex scenarios of how vortices are moving. And this is, a, this is purely done by flow visualization. And it turns out uh, that uh, uh, some really brave pilots are flying a helicopter with uh, a bunch of, uh, let me actually make it full screen so that it's easier. Ah, uh, no. Okay. So they basically uh, shoot out water over here to visualize what the flow field is like. And uh, what you can see is that the helicopter deliberately is flying into its own uh, vortex weight. And here what you see is that uh, 
all these vortices are uh, are really like moving with the flow, right? So, and this is another another good visualization for you to visualize like how the air is responding to the lift of not an airplane but a helicopter. So as the helicopter is flying forward, the air gets really pushed down by these blades and uh, uh, forming a downwash behind it. All right. So so this is uh, uh, this is uh, of course a more complex scenario, and uh, for us we'll first be looking at how vortices would be moving behind an airplane. But in order to understand that, we also need to understand another thing, right? We know that vortices move with the flow, but how does the flow move? So this is, a, this is the opposite question of how vortices move. That is, how would the flow field move around the vortices in 3D? Once we have these two questions, that provides a complete answer, right? So we know how the flow field is like around the vortices. And then we also know how the vortices would move in that flow field. So by combining these two answers to these two questions, we can pretty much figure out how a three-dimensional flow is like behind really any kind of uh, uh, objects that whose viscous effect can be neglected. Okay. So there is another very, a very long mathematical derivation we are going to skip over here. But uh, let me just uh, give you the conclusion of that mathematical analysis. Okay? Remember in 2D, the flow around a single vortex, right? So if we have a vortex spinning in this direction, what is the flow field like if the circulation of that vortex is gamma? Uh, the flow field rotates, and how does the velocity change, increase, or decrease as the distance to the, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the center of the vortex? So let's say this is located at 0. Uh, let's say x0 and y0, to be more general. The x velocity u, right, would be negative when y is larger than y zero and the positive, right, when y is less than y zero. So there is a negative sign over here, and we have y minus y zero divided by the square, the distance plus x minus x zero, and v would be plus x minus x0 divided by the same denominator. The combined effect of this term makes the velocity magnitude to be inversely proportional to the distance to the center and the direction to be purely in the circumferential direction. Right? Okay? And... Uh, uh, there is a multiplier that's gamma over 2 pi. Basically, that multiplier ensures that the circulation, when you draw a circle around this vortex, the circulation, the integrated velocity along that line has to be exactly equal to gamma, the circulation. So that's the flow field around a single vortex in 2D. And if I have multiple vortexes, I just add the flow field on top of each other, right? So that's what we have been doing so far in 2D. In 3D, the nice thing is that we can use exactly the same principle of superposition. If we have multiple vortices, we can just add them together. But the flow field around a single vortex, it's a little bit more complicated. That's because a single vortex in 3D is not a single point, right? It's a line. It's a line of vortex. And there is no universal way of describing a flow field around the line because the line can be anything. It can be a straight line. It can be a ring. It can be a rectangle. It can be, well, 
anything <laughs> you want. I mean, the only thing we know is that uh, a vortex has no end in the sense that it cannot end anywhere in space. So in 3D, the in 3D, the corresponding equation is actually has to be uh, in calculus form. And the reason is that uh, there is no way to describe a general vortex. So what we have to uh, do is that the velocity is now a integral along the length of a vortex. So the integral, and if a vortex has no ends, it has to be a like integral along the loop of that vortex. Okay, and along the loop of the vortex, so we have a dl that is in the direction of the vortex. All right, and uh, uh, there is also a term that's divided by the distance, in this case cubed between the whatever x location is and the location of that vortex so uh, let me let me write it a little bit more carefully so so you uh, don't know why can't I click okay So u at x, okay, so that's an integral, and uh, let me say the location of that uh, line is uh, dl as a function of y. So y is the location of that vortex element, that small segment of vortex. So x minus y, uh, the magnitude cubed, all right, and then there is the dl has to be cross product with x minus y so that is going to be the vorticity field and again you need to multiply a multiplier so in this case is gamma over 4 pi in order for the uh, for the circulation around that vortex to be exactly equal to gamma. All right. So one of the things we can let me say this is cross and this is x. Okay. One of the things we can verify is that does this degenerate into the two-dimensional scenario? <coughs> if I indeed have a vortex that stretches along the z direction for infinity, that is the case where we are analyzing a vortex in 2D, right? The 2D scenario corresponds to things doesn't change in the z direction. So in the case of a vortex doesn't change in the z direction, it just simply points towards the z direction and uh, goes on forever, right? So in this case, what is going to be dl? dl would just be 0, 0, and dz. Right? Okay, and uh, a dl cross product with x minus y, <laughs> well, that's going to be simply dz times x minus y in the, uh, well, let, let me, I, I think uh, the notation y is a little bit uh, tricky because uh, here both x and y are vectors. They don't actually represent. Uh, uh, okay, so 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 maybe maybe let me let me uh, let me use a little bit uh, better notation to to avoid the potential confusion of uh, x and y. So let me write this as a dl as a function of x naught. That's the location of the vortex, and uh, then we'll have the distance between x and, and x naught 
and x minus x naught. All right. So dl is going to be this, and uh, uh, x minus x naught is going to be written as uh, three components: x minus x naught as a scalar, y minus y naught, and z minus z naught. All right. So in this case, dl cross product with x minus x naught would just be the vector of uh, it's going to be 0 in the z direction because both x and y component of dl is going to be 0 and in the x and y direction we have dz times y minus y naught in the x direction and minus dz times x uh, minus x naught in the y direction. Let me let me make sure this is actually uh, the sign is actually correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one second. Dz. I, I think the sign is the opposite. So this should be a negative, and uh, the uh, y direction should be positive. All right, so now we can see that the DL cross product with the difference in location actually recovers the numerator of the two dimensional flow field around the vortex, right? And now what we want to figure out is the, is the denominator. So we would be integrating the Q of the difference between X and X naught along the z direction. Why is dl 0, 0? OK, so why is dl 0, 0, dz? Because we are considering a two-dimensional vortex in 3D. And what does a two-dimensional vortex in 3D mean? It's just a line like this, but extended infinitely in the third dimension. right? So if you are now considering a small segment, of that three-dimensional line. That's just a, uh, there is no x and y component in that line, and the z component is just uh, uh, represented as dz. OK. And the remaining part is you have to really just uh, integrate from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, you have dz, and you are divided by basically you have x minus x naught square plus y minus y naught square plus z minus z naught square to the power of uh, 1.5. So that corresponds to the cube. And uh, when you uh, when you integrate it, uh, basically you are going to get this. Actually, you get a factor of two, and you have x minus x naught square and uh, y minus y naught square. All right, so the factor of 2 actually cancels with the gamma over 4 pi here to get you that gamma over 2 pi in two dimensions. So this kind of integration is the basis for a lot of the flow analysis tools in three dimensions. So for example, the most basic scenario is the flow field behind a rectangular wing that provides you a uniform distribution of lift across the entire span. So in that case, what is the flow field like can be simply described by a what's, what's known as a horseshoe <coughs> vortex. Okay. So we have learned in a two-dimensional flow field that um, the amount of lift provided by the wing is proportional to the free stream velocity times the circulation around that airflow section. That result generalizes to a three-dimensional wing that is a, a high that has a high has aspect ratio. Right. So essentially, what happens is that there is a constant gamma. There is a constant circulation around the wing. 
if the wind provides a constant lift per cross section. But when you get to the tip of the wind, as we know that vorticity cannot end anywhere, right? So the vortex has to come out of the wind somehow. Well, and also because the vortex is now in air, it has to satisfy the equations that describes the movement of vorticity. So that vortex for a steady state flow field can either go upstream or downstream. Of course, the solution that the vortices goes upstream is not physical because we know at in front of the aircraft, right, the air is undisturbed and it should not contain any vorticity. As a result, the only solution you have is that the vortices now trails downstream, starting from the trailing edge of the wings. This is basically what you see when you are looking at a video of an airplane landing, right? Except for the case when you have an air airplane landing, the vortices really come out, the strongest vortex come out not from the tip of the wings, but really from the tip of the flaps because you have a sudden change in how much lift is provided by the inboard section of the wing due to the flaps and the outboard section of the wing without the, the flaps. So the circulation in this section and this section changes suddenly and pretty dramatically, right? And uh, as, as we know again, the, uh, from, a, from just a, a simple kinematics analysis, if you draw a sphere around the, the uh, flap gap, <coughs> the outflux of vorticity around that sphere has to be exactly zero, right? So there is really a, uh, I mean, if the, if the vortex uh, points that way, there is a, if you draw a sphere over here, if you draw a sphere over here, there is a outflux of vorticity over there. And uh, if this is a flap gap, there is a much smaller influx of vorticity from the outward portion of the wing. As a result, the total amount of outflux has to be equal to zero. That means there has to be an influx right from the trailing vortex. Yes? Uh, the flap gap is uh, where where the end of the flap is so so if you look at an airplane wing right a uh, typical airplane wing you have you have this is the aileron this is where the aileron is uh, and uh, uh, here you have flaps so here is the gap right the gap uh, between the aileron section and the flap section is uh, the location where the strongest vortex comes out during a landing configuration. The flaps would be deployed, so this section of the wing creates very high lift, while this section of the wing is still having a much smaller lift coefficient. So the sudden change in the amount of circulation you have around the wing in this section and the amount of circulation you have around the wing in this section makes it necessary to have a vortex coming out over here. So if you draw uh, this vortex, there is much smaller and uh, as a result, there is a vortex that's like that. Make sense? Okay, so now how does this distribution of vorticity help to analyze the flow field? Now that gets back to our equation. Right, that it describes the flow field around these vortices. So for example, if you want to know the flow field over here, you have to integrate along this part of the vortex, then along this part of the vortex, and then along this part of the vortex. This is a little bit more complex from our two-dimensional case. Our two-dimensional case assumes to have an infinitely long wing, so this vortex extends both ways to infinity, and you only need to integrate over this vortex. Now we have three segments you have to integrate <coughs> separately. But let's just uh, first of all qualitatively look at uh, what the flow field is like. 
steady. First of all, this vortex on the wing has the traditional, has the same traditional effect as the wing in a two-dimensional setting. If you think what the vortex does, uh, remember like when you were playing with the flow builder, right, by placing vortices on the web page, this vortex creates a upflow ahead of the wing and a downflow behind the wing. Okay, so that's the tra traditional effect. And the further away you go, the less effect it has. It dies out proportional <coughs> to 1 over gamma in 2D. Except for in this case, it, the, the effect of this vortex actually dies out even further, I mean even faster, because as you go away from this vortex, you no longer have contribution from this part, right? There is no vorticity over this part. If you are close to the wing, this vortex looks like it's infinitely long because uh, uh, it extends so much further than the distance from the observer and the wing. But if the observer is sufficiently away from the wing, let's say one span or two spans away from the wing, then this vortex no longer looks like infinitely long, right? It's apparently it's finite length because it's zero over here and here. So the downwash, the effect of downwash from the wing becomes less severe as you travel further away. However, we have this vortex and this vortex both contributing to a downwash in between these two vortices. And this effect not only uh, not only doesn't decay as fast as the effect from this vortex, it doesn't decay at all. Right? Because these two vortices have constant strength no matter how much downstream you go. And in fact, as you go further downstream, the more effect these two vortices would have. Okay, so this is really uh, the basis of computing the flow field downstream of the airplane. And also these two uh, vortices would have an upwash outward of the uh, wing tubes. Okay, so all of this allows you to compute almost exactly how the flow field looks like around and behind an airplane. Now, of course, this is very useful because if you're placing a horizontal stabilizer over here behind the main wing, you do want to know how much downwash is on the horizontal stabilizer, right? Because that may invalidate your assumption in stability analysis that the horizontal stabilizer and the main wing are at the same angle of attack because, well, it is not. So the horizontal stabilizer uh, obviously is going to have a higher or lower angle of attack than the main wing. Lower, lower right? Because there is downwash on the horizontal stabilizer. Even the main wing itself is actually at a lower angle of attack than if it doesn't create the downwash. Because, well, even though the vortex along the wing can be seen as having no effect on the flow field around the wing itself, because it creates a upwash upstream and downwash downstream, these two vortices does have a significant effect on the main wing. It actually has, I mean, if you think about the symmetry, right, this vortex extends infinitely in one direction, but not at all in the other direction. So the effect of this vortex on the wing itself would be exactly half as much as from our two-dimensional analysis. Because our two-dimensional analysis, uh, the two-dimensional flow field around the vortex corresponds to a vortex that points infinitely in one direction and the other direction. Well, this vortex is exactly half of the infinite vortex, right? So, so basically, we can compute almost exactly what the flow field is around on the wing itself, if the wing is non-swept. All right, and uh, 
uh, this would be a book I would refer you to if you want to know a little bit more about all the derivations that gets you this formula of how the flow field is around on the three-dimensional vortex. Okay, so there is a, a plenty of uh, plenty of math involved that uh, not only is applicable in fluid dynamics, it is actually first derived in electromagnetism. So the same formula actually describes uh, what is the, for example, the same formula describes what is the magnetic field around a uh, uh, around the, like a uh, uh, conducting wire, right? If you if you run the run the uh, electrical current on a wire, that wire behaves like a vortex, and uh, the magnetic field around that current can be described uh, in as the same way as the velocity field around the vortex. So, um, and uh, yeah, this is known as the Biot uh, Savart equation. It's really first uh, derived by these two people in the field of uh, electromagnetics. And uh, later on, when you look at the fluid dynamics equations, mm -hmm. you see exactly the same equations that relates velocity and the vorticity, and therefore, the same mathematics arrives from that. Okay, uh, so so in this class, we're not going to be focused on the mathematical derivation, but really on the consequences of these, uh, uh, the, this, these mathematics. So, for example, let me uh, assign you a simple exercise of trying to calculate the induced drag exactly on uh, i shouldn't say exactly but uh, numerically right now this time quantitatively on the way okay and we're going to be using the formula that the induced drag from a semi infinite vortex so we are looking at the wing span of 10 meters so the total thing is 10 meters right and uh, we have a constant cl of 0.5 so we know how much lift is generated on this wing, and therefore how much circulation is going to be on this wing. All right. So we know that if there is a circulation of gamma on the wing, the same circulation gamma, if, if you can tape the uh, paper, that would be great. The same gamma is going to be trailing on both <laughs> wing tips. Now, the effect of this vortex and this vortex on the certain location on the wing is half as much as if you have a vortex that exactly goes to not only infinitely long downstream of the airplane, but also infinitely long upstream of the airplane. So is the effect of this vortex is half of a vortex that goes both ways. Right, and we know how much downwash is created on the infinitely long vortex because we learned the two-dimensional flow field around the vortex. All right, so please uh, start thinking about okay, how much? I mean, uh, again, we're assuming a uh, rho uh, as the density that's incompressible flow, so it's constant, and we have u u infinity as the flow coming from a, a free stream and we know a constant CL so please go and calculate for example uh, let's start with uh, how much is the circulation okay and second how much downwash right what is the velocity in the downward direction at the center of the wing 50% span 75% span and 90% span all right, make sense? Um, we know the width at <coughs> each section, right? And then we just plug it out. It's like, there's going to be more induced drag. Um, or what? 
Okay, so we are running out of time, so maybe uh, let me just uh, talk uh, through the, especially the second part of the question, right? I, I think for the first part of the question, uh, we are, all the groups either already got it or is on the way of doing numerical calculations, right? So, uh, so basically, the, the real difficult question is on the second one. How do we estimate quantitatively the amount of induced drag? So question one really figures out how much induced flow, how much downwash is over here at middle of the wing and over here at 50% and 75% and 90% of the wing, right? So uh, if you crunch out the numbers, you're going to find out that the induced velocity in the middle is the least. And as you go towards the wing tip, you get more and more downwash. Now, if you want to estimate the induced drag, what we need to know is that the velocity at the wing is now not just the, the free stream velocity, it's a compound of the free stream and its induced uh, downwash. So let's say this is the free stream, right? And uh, we have the downwash. So as a result, the total velocity is going to be pointing slightly down like that, right? So by the downwash. All right. The lift, the local lift vector, now instead of pointing straight up, the lift is always orthogonal to the direction of relative velocity. So, so this downwash actually points, rotates the lift from straight up to a lift vector that points slightly backwards. And it's this component of the lift vector that contributes to the induced drag. Okay, so what we really need to do is basically figure that out on all the different cross sections, right? The, the lift would be tilted even more backward near the tip. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but uh, uh, the lift would be pointed more and more backwards towards the tip. And to estimate the induced drag, you just need to perform a integral, uh, usually a numerical integral, right, of the tilt of the lift vector. So one simple approximation is that, uh, okay, uh, you can think about uh, uh, the total drag being approximated by something like this, right? So you can just uh, count the area beneath it to figure out how much induced drag you get. And this is pretty much the formula used in uh, all the so-called the lifting line theory codes that if you give me a distribution of lift coefficients and also wing plane form, like what is the core length distribution from the center to the tip, the code just uh, splits the wing into many small sections and calculates how much uh, vortex coming out of the gap between one, one section and another section and then calculates the downwash at the center of the different sections and it uses numerical integration to compute how much total induced drag the airplane has. All right, so so this is uh, uh, really the first uh, application of three-dimensional vortex dynamics and uh, we'll learn more about uh, we will we, we use more when we get to Wednesday and we'll start to not just to look at airplanes but also vertical lift devices like helicopters and uh, things like that. How do they generate lift? How do vortices evolve in this kind of uh, devices and how much induced drag a helicopter would have? Not just when it's flying forward but when it's actually hovering in place. I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank <laughs> you.